Good Tuesday afternoon. Thank you for hopping on NCSA Live. I'm David Kamisic, Senior Recruiting Manager here with Next College Student Athlete. Uh, for the next half hour, we're going to hopefully educate you guys on the recruiting process. We're going to start with a, a specific topic and then uh, certainly want to open it up to any questions you guys may have. So whatever platform you're watching us on, whether it's Twitter, or YouTube, Facebook, whatever it is, uh, jot any questions you have there at the bottom of the page, whether it be, again, specifically about what we're going to talk about or just anything in the recruiting process. We'll get to as many of those as we can over the, the next half hour. You don't have to stare at me for that entire period, though. We have uh, Kyle Winters, one of our recruiting managers, joining me as well. Kyle, good Tuesday afternoon. Good Tuesday. I would happily just stare at you this uh, this whole half hour and, and listen to you because your voice is so silky and smooth. I can just drink it in for the next 30 minutes for sure. Well, I, you know. I'll take that as a compliment and leave that at that. So uh, awesome. Well, uh, today's topic, we're going to start talking about the uh, the college offer process, right? And understanding the different types of college offers uh, that are out there. Um, dive into, you know, do coaches give athletes deadlines to accept these offers? You know, how athletes can negotiate their athletic scholarships. There's a lot of different moving pieces when it comes to the scholarship process. So Kyle, let's start with you. First and foremost, obviously, one of the biggest things in, in terms of college scholarships for sports are athletic scholarships. Um, but depending on the division level, the school, there's a lot of different variables that go into that process and, and how those work. So first and foremost, is what is an athletic scholarship offer? Um, and, and talk a little bit more in depth about where those are offered. Yeah, definitionally athletic scholarships, uh, they're offered at the NCAA D1 and D2 levels, as well as NAIA and uh, NJCAA levels, which is junior college. Uh, combined, that's, that's thousands of schools, while Division three schools they cannot offer, offer athletic scholarships, um, whereas 80% of Division three athletes receive some sort of uh, financial aid. So, you know, they can be broken down into several different categories, uh, full-ride athletic scholarship, a full-ride scholarship, a partial athletic scholarship, a walk-on offer. We'll go through those each individually. But, um, uh, yeah, like you said, everybody's trying to get a, a scholarship. Uh, college is incredibly expensive these days. Um, I think we've talked about it before that in-state tuition on average is like $25,000 a year or something like that. And out-of-state tuition is closer to like $50,000 a year. I might be inflating those numbers a little bit. But um, obviously, yeah, everybody's striving toward trying to earn a, a scholarship of some sort, a full-ride athletic scholarship. It's going to be more that, something that covers the, the major costs of attending college, like tuition, room and board, books, some of the course fees, whereas like a full full ride scholarship, those are only going to be available specifically for ath ath athletics, um, the six headcount sports like football, men's and women's basketball, women's gymnastics, tennis, and volleyball. Those are the only sports that offer a specifically full ride athletic scholarship. And I think we'll talk more about, you know, the, the combination and stacking of athletic and academic scholarships and how that can add up to a full ride scholarship as well. Yeah, so the majority of, of student athletes that are playing at the collegiate level, they're not getting full rides to college just based off their athletics. It's very rare, actually, especially outside of those six sports that Kyle talked about, um, known as the equivalency sports, um, that that's kids are getting full scholarships. So the other sports that, that we didn't hit on there, so again, everything but football, men's and women's hoop, it's all partial scholarships for the most part. So a school may have 10 scholarships available for a specific uh, sport for that that program. But those kids, for the most part, are not getting full rides. Coaches are able to break those up into pieces. So a student athlete may get 50% of an athletic scholarship. They may get 20%. They may get 75%. So there are different um, portions of scholarships that college coaches have available to give out to student athletes. And that's a challenging part for a college coach, right? If I have a roster of 30 kids, but I only have 9.8 scholarships available. Well, I can't give everyone a full scholarship, so I've got to break it up into pieces um, and give them a partial athletic scholarships, which can still cover a significant portion of the college cost process, um, but it's not going to cover all of it. So, um, Kyle, we also hear a lot about the walk-on process, um, which is uh, really no scholarships for those kids. Those student athletes are going to that school. They're paying their way. They're walking on to the program. Um, touch a little bit more about the walk-on process. I know that's something that people feel they can just go walk on to a program at a school, which isn't always the case. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and every year you hear the story about the, the kicker or punter that has been at the school for four years. And then on the last day of the preseason, they, they have to make this kick to earn a scholarship or the coach gives them a scholarship right before the season starts and they get that walk-on scholarship. 
or they get a scholarship after having walked on for several years. Um, oftentimes, it's, it's really not that easy. The, the walk-on opportunities that exist out there are, are you know, somewhat few and far between. But it, what, what that is, it means the coach would like you on the team but cannot or, or won't be able to offer you any sort of financial assistance. Uh, walk-ons can potentially earn more monetary scholarships going into further future season, seasons, but really nothing's guaranteed. So uh, when it comes to like a walk-on opportunity, a lot of people have the misconception that it's just you go to the school, you go and try out for the team. While a lot of schools are going to have an opportunity for you to go and try out for that team, most of the walk-on positions that end up getting filled are filled by student athletes that college coach recruited to that program. They had conversations with them. They are very interested in them, but they just don't have scholarship money or they don't have any sort of financial aid that they can give to that student athlete um, from an athletic standpoint. Now they can help out with, they can talk about academic scholarships and merit-based scholarships, but it's still going to be a walk-on offer an opportunity. Just take note that it's not most of the time that you just go to the school and try out for the team, though obviously that does happen. Sure. Um, so again, opportunities, right, in terms of the athletic scholarship. But as Kyle mentioned, you can also get academic money. So you can stack those scholarships is what coaches refer to it as. So a coach may be willing to offer you 40 percent of an athletic scholarship. If your grades are in a good enough place and that coach can go to the admissions board and um, say, hey, the student athlete's got really good grades. Maybe they can you know, offer 25 percent of an academic scholarship. So then you get 65 percent of your school paid for. Hopefully you guys are following along the, the math at home with me. But um, again, athletic scholarships are, are coveted, um, but they're also uh, very valuable to college coaches. They're not just offering these to anybody. You know, they're making sure that they're prioritizing that. So let's bring in someone from our college coach relations team, Christy Nisipani Cicero, or as she's affectionately known as CNC around here. Christy, how are you? Great, David. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful now that I get to see your smiling face and you get to to add some knowledge here. So uh, you were a former college coach. You work a lot with our college coaches. Um, one question that we get a lot from families is how long does an offer last for? So a student athlete is offered a scholarship by a college coach. There's not necessarily a deadline, but there are things that you need to think about from a student athlete standpoint in terms of how many other kids may be getting offered. What's that coach's priority? So walk us through that a little bit. How does a coach offer that scholarship? And what's the time that that scollarship may be available for? Yeah, that is, that's a fun question to answer because there's so many different hats that I need to put on from, you know, a student athlete perspective slash family and a college coach. So I guess I'll start off with a college coach. Um, full scholarships are, or I shouldn't even say full, any sort of scholarship will be presented either in person at the time of your visit, or maybe even really after your visit is more likely the time that that offer will happen. Um, and I say that because, you know, a coach will probably pick up the phone after your visit, maybe a week after saying, hey, you know, we're offering you, offering you X, Y, and Z, because they really want to see what you're like in person with your family, uh, how you act on campus. And that's going to determine, um, hey, you know, coaching staff, do we offer this kid? Is this somebody that we want to bring into our program after going to that visit? Now, in regards of, in regards of the timeline of it, um, it's going to be by college coach. Um, I know at one particular place that I worked at, we put on hard deadline saying, hey, we're offering you uh, X scholarship um, or even like an X walk on position. You have two weeks, you have a month to make that decision. I worked at another place under a different coach that said, you know what, we're going to be, you know, offering. Um, it's going to be first come, first serve. And if a kid doesn't get back to us, we're going to say, hey, somebody else took your spot. So it's kind of a tricky uh, way to answer this because it does go um, school by school, coach by coach, and heck, even sport by sport. Um, so definitely be mindful of that. Now, from a student athlete and family perspective, deadlines can be very, very, very stressful. Um, when I was a college coach, uh, and at the time when, you know, rules were not as tight as they were, I will say, um, you know, when we were offering an eighth or a ninth grader a potential full ride scholarship, I personally would always tell the families, do not feel pressured. We're offering you this. We know that you're going to have more to come. Make sure you are doing your due diligence and finding that right fit for you. We love you. We want you to come here. And this is why we're offering you this. Um, but make sure you take your time. So my suggestion for that, for families and, and student athletes, if you ever feel rushed by a coach, um, play the game back a little bit. Don't, don't feel rushed because this is your decision. This is, this is, you know, your 
your life. Um, so, you know, if somebody's offering you a full scholarship, don't just jump on that first one just because they're like, hey, we need to know in two weeks. Make sure you're, you know, doing your due diligence and, and researching that school properly. Yeah, we'll talk about playing the game in a second. But Christy, I think you hit on a good point in terms of college coaches should be communicating in terms of maybe what that is. But also a student athlete or a family shouldn't be afraid to ask the coach, right? If, if you're a point guard and that coach is looking to bring in one point guard, and they've offered five. Are they accepting the first offer? Are they going to wait for your, your your response? Those are conversations that coaches are used to having. It's going to be unusual for a student athlete who's 16, 17 years old to be asking those questions. But certainly something that, that a student athlete should know is, you know, what, what's my timeline? What's my deadline here? And, and the older you are as a student athlete, the more that deadline may be in place if that coach is in a rush to fill in that roster spot. Yes, definitely ask every single hard question you can. Because like you said, David, um, Coaches are used to these types of conversations, but sometimes it'll also catch them a little bit off guard. Like, wow, you know, the student athlete really knows their stuff. They really understand the recruiting process. Um, and I know that you said, you know, we're, we're going to be kind of talking a little bit more about playing the game, if you will. But yes, definitely go in there and ask. So I am a point guard. You're offering me this. Well, how many other guys have you offered? Um, you know, what is my timeline? Is it the first come first serve? Am I going to lose my spot? Um, because not only is it going to give you insight to how the coach recruits or, but it also kind of shows how um, prioritized you are um, and where you're at on their recruiting board, essentially. Yeah. The more they want you, the more they're going to, they're going to push for you. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned too, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, you were offering scholarships to, to kids. So again, this isn't just a junior senior thing. Kids can be getting offers, you know, freshman year, sophomore year, even in eighth grade, uh, depending on the certain, certain sports as well. Um, Kyle, let's go back to you. Let's put yourself in the student athletes, you know, foot here. Um, you get that first athletic scholarship offer. You're excited about it. Um, you know, you, you're trying to figure out like, is this the right fit for me? What are some tips that you would give to a student athlete who's maybe thinking about accepting that offer? But what are some things that the families and student athletes should be thinking about before you know you're saying yes to that offer because again it can be a difficult situation if you commit to a school and then you change your mind and you decommit and then you're putting yourself back out there it's a, a tough process so what advice would you have for families that are be weighing that athletic scholarship offer yeah thankfully it's uh, pretty easy to put myself in this uh scenario because i was in this scenario going through the recruiting process i, I had a couple different scholarship offers from a couple of different schools and you really have to weigh your priorities you have to weigh what's going to be most important to you um is, is one school going to be a better um a better cultural fit for you you're going to have uh more people you feel comfortable with is it going to be a bigger setting that you feel better in? is it going to be a smaller setting where you're not going to feel overwhelmed by um there being thousands or tens of thousands of student athletes there um, is, the, is the coaching system, have you, have you gotten it along with the coaches more so at one place than the other? Um, are the academics going to be a better fit at one facility or one school as opposed to another? Um, there, there's really an endless um, list of, you know, uh, different, different things you can be looking at from a student athlete uh, perspective to determine whether or not this is going to be the right fit. For me, it ended up being one school had a larger scholarship offer, it was 100%, uh, which was uh, baseball, it was athletic and academic combined. And the other school came up about 99%, which was still great. I was very thankful for that. But, uh, you know, I, my family didn't have a ton of money for me to go to school, so I ended up choosing the school that was 100%. And then being able to have those hard conversations with those coaches and, and having a conversation with that second coach who couldn't get to 100%, I learned a lot about him, was actually thankful I didn't choose that school because he did not take it very well and didn't seem like the type of person that I would want to be dealing with after that. So, you know, weigh, weigh all those different factors, those those different priorities for you as a student athlete, for you as a family, and you put together a list of pros and cons and, and see which one adds up to the most and, and see which one's going to be the best fit and be willing to have those hard conversations with the coach. Uh, I was talking with the college coach just last week about a student athlete who – um, turn down their offer via text message, and they were pretty bummed out about that. So be willing to pick up the phone and have a conversation with the coach to talk it through with them as well. I know they'll appreciate it, and it'll just show a little more maturity on your end also. Yeah, and also to note again, you can accept an offer uh, anytime sophomore year, junior year, freshman year. You technically cannot sign your national letter of intent until your senior year. And again, that's for Division I uh, and Division II schools for those uh, athletic scholarships. That's once you've been accepted by the college. Financial aid's been drawn up if that's included. But again, offers can be 
going out at any point, you can verbally commit, but you cannot sign your national letter of intent until your senior year. Um, there's a period, uh, depending on the sport, again, as to when that process starts. Uh, Christy, let's bring you back in. Let's talk about playing that game. Uh, you, you get a scholarship <laughs> offer. It's an exciting thing. Maybe that coach is only offering you 25% of a scholarship. Maybe another coach comes to you and says, hey, we're willing to offer you 50% of a scholarship. How do you approach that as a student athlete? Again, that can be a difficult conversation to have with a college coach, but the more leverage you have, the more options, the more ability you have to, to negotiate that or try to get more money out of a program. Yeah, and it just goes back to you know having that honest and truthful conversation with the coach you know it, let's take kyle's example right you know he it, um you know his family didn't have a lot of money to you know help him through college and you know really couldn't get that 99 percent school up and lo and behold kyle learned a ton about that coach and didn't want to play for him anyway um that speaks volume so don't be afraid to have those conversations because at the end of the day and i could say this with a with a full heart because i i was a college coach, like we play the game. Um, you know, th this is, it, it's a game, it's a business. And, you know, you have to make sure that um, you're doing everything you can to get the best offer. Now, it is tricky though, um, because, you know, you, you do have to almost know your self-worth and your self-value. So, you know, if you don't, if you're not a full scholarship kid, you can't go into a coach's office saying, hey, I deserve this. You know, you just have to make sure that you are coming off humble. Um, you know, again, know your value, know your self-worth, um, but understand, you know, they are judging you by the questions that you ask. So make sure that you are coming fully honest, fully prepared, and also fully prepared for the answer. Because sometimes, you know, it is, you know, just a very truthful conversation with that coach saying, hey, listen, we only have, 25% of athletic money. It's not you. That's just literally what we have. So sometimes the answers might not be what you want. Um, so come prepared for that as well, but always go into that coach's office with a clear mind, full heart, and ask those difficult questions and play that game because they're playing the game with you. You just quoted Friday Night Lights, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose, right? I did. And I almost said can't lose, but I didn't. I, I got you. I got you. Missed opportunity. Uh, yeah. And again, that's where as a student athlete, the more the more options you have, the, the more leverage you can build, right? If I'm a student athlete and I'm going to a college coach who's offered me a 25% athletic scholarship, uh, that coach is going to ask me, okay, well, maybe what other schools are interested in you? And if I say none, that coach doesn't have a whole lot of motivation to up his ante to make that scholarship that much more. But if I come back and say, well, I've got this school that's interested in offering me this, this school's offering me that, suddenly I'm more coveted by other schools. And that coach needs to decide, do I want to up the ante to, to bring you in or am I okay maybe letting you go knowing that I can't match that offer? And again, that's going to depend too on how much scholarship money that coach is going to um, have available. Kyle, it's also important to know scholarships can change. A scholarship, you don't just sign it your freshman year and it's guaranteed the next four years for that amount. There are certain things that coaches can do to maybe up that uh, scholarship every year. Talk a little bit about that process and what coaches are, are doing or how they're identifying maybe who – is going to be getting more money the next year, depending on what becomes available for their program. Yeah, like Christy talked about, coaches, they have a certain amount of money each year. They have to really budget that over the course of, of four years or so with a student athlete. Um, and, and there are some good, there are going to be some examples or some situations where maybe they're top heavy with, with seniors who have a lot of scholarship money accrued, and maybe they're going to be losing six or seven seniors that have scholarship money tied up in them this year. So um, a coach might let you know that, hey, freshman year coming in, I have 25%. I have 30% of scholarship money available for you that I can use, but the rest of it's tied up in juniors and seniors. When these seniors graduate, there's going to be more money available. So potentially sophomore year, you're going to be able to earn this much. You're going to have this much scholarship money to pay for, for school. And junior year, maybe this much. And senior year, maybe this much. That's something they may lay out for you as, as like a potential. This is something that could happen. Like we talked about, it's not going to be set in stone. Some of that's going to be based on, have you earned that? Or are you someone that deserves more scholarship money? I can speak to my my sister who played Division One college softball. She's a four-year starter. She came in as a freshman, had a little bit of scholarship money um, her freshman year, and was able to accrue more over the next few years uh, going into her senior year because there were less seniors. There's more scholarship money available to that coach. Um, so it's something that you want to kind of get ahead of. It's a conversation that you want to – um, know that there's potential for um, and, and ask them up front, is there going to be more scholarship money down the road? And then 
that's going to be a new conversation for you to have each year with that college coach. And you might have to ask them, what do I need to do? Or what do you need from me to be someone who earns more of that scholarship money as a sophomore, as a junior, as a senior, and hopefully they can give you very clear outline or guidelines of what that takes or what, what will need to happen or what you'll need to do or what commitments you'll need to keep to earn that additional scholarship money. If they can't lay that out, that's maybe a bad sign for you as well. Maybe you want to pursue other options. Yeah. At the end of the day, though, the, the more valuable you are to that program, the more money that coach is maybe going to offer you or that you deserve. So, uh, again, if you get out of that program just because you're only getting 25% of a scholarship doesn't mean that can't change. If you continue to improve and become a valuable piece, that coach – uh, certainly may reward you for that as well. So again, receiving offers, it's a its a fun part of the recruiting process. It's a later part in the recruiting process, not something that's typically happening uh, day one that a coach evaluates you. But uh, it's important to know the, the type of offers that are out there um, for families to understand, you know, how to talk through these situations, knowing that, again, not every scholarship that you get offered is going to be a, a full ride. Everything's paid for and good to go. So many sports, especially um, as you get down to the Division II level, um, are going to be, you know, partial scholarships. And these coaches, again, they have to do a lot of budgeting on their end to make sure that they're, you know, spending their money wisely because, again, that's ultimately what's keeping them a job, how they're spending those scholarships and the type of, of student athletes that they're bringing in. Uh, can we get a three box? Three shot, let's get to some questions here. That's, <laughs> that's TV talk right there, a three box, three shot, whatever, whatever it is. Um, we got some questions coming in. Kyle, let's start with you for this one from Mike. Uh, Mike wants to know a little bit more about the definition of kind of the walk-on process. Um, so he wants to know if you're getting academic money and going to the school to wrestle, are you still considered a walk-on? Yeah, my good question. Um, I, I would say that's pretty definitionally what a walk-on would be. If you're you're being recruited to come and play that sport at the school and you're coming to compete in wrestling, you've had that conversation with the coach. They're bringing you in to wrestle, uh, but they don't have athletic scholarship money for you, then, then they, you would be technically – considered a walk-on at that school. The other scenario would be is if it's a division three school where they don't have athletic scholarship money from a technical standpoint, everyone would be considered a walk-on in a division three scenario. So it sounds like you are in a walk-on scenario, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's all about playing your sport, playing your, uh, uh, playing your sport at your school and using that to get some of your school paid for, which it sounds like you're doing, which is great. More power to you. Well, cool. awesome. Let's uh, get a question here from Johnson. Christy, will she answer this one? Uh, is it bad to ask a coach if an injury will result in the loss of scholarship? Another tricky situation here. Um, how do coaches handle that? If you're on scholarship, you get injured. It can, it can be a, a kind of a program by program situation, depending on the injury. But um, how would you approach that as a student athlete to, to trying to you know, figure out is that scholarship still there if I'm injured? Yeah, uh, I would definitely ask that. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, I will leave at least 0.01%. Um, coaches will never take away your scholarship if you get injured. Um, it's just kind of uh, a cardinal rule, if you will, an unwritten rule that if you get injured and it's like a career ending injury, they're not going to take away your scholarship because they offered that to you and they're never going to want to rip uh, an opportunity away from you to finish your degree. Now, if you break a rule or something pretty bad, um, they could rip that away. But yeah, definitely ask coaches. It, it's it's not a secret. It's nothing uh, that coaches would shy away from or um, like tiptoe around to answer that. So uh, again, ask the question, but normally coaches will not take away a scholarship due to an injury. Well, we got a question here from Dustin. A uh, good question about the recruiting process with coaches not being involved. Kyle, if my college or my high school coach or travel coach is doing nothing to get anyone recruited, what do you do? Yeah, Dustin, it's a great question. And, and we wish that our high school coaches and travel coaches were getting us opportunities coming out of the wazoo. But uh, when it comes to travel and high school coaches, I'm sure almost every single one of them wants to help in that process. But they don't always have the time. They have their own lives, their own families. They have their own jobs outside of coaching most of the time. Sometimes they're teachers at the school. They have a team with 15 to 20, maybe an organization of 60 to 100 kids that they're working with. It's just very difficult for them to focus on every single individual student athlete. That's why we talk about student athletes being the ones and families being the ones who are driving their own recruiting processes. So you know, the, the basics we talk about, create a profile in NCSA, build up that profile, put everything on there, get your video on there, update your video, be proactive, sending it out to college coaches. Um, spread your information to a wide array of coaches, 
and try to narrow it down from there, build relationships and narrow it down to the school that's going to be the right fit for you. It's all about being proactive and just not waiting for coaches to come find you. Um, unfortunately, thousands every year who are good enough, smart enough, miss out on opportunities just because of the sheer fact coaches never find out who they are. So be proactive, be the one who's driving the process versus waiting for coaches to come find you. Yeah, and even if your club or travel coach or high school coach is helping, I think that's good advice to, to not just rely on them. They obviously may know some coaches, but do they know everybody? So the more, again, you can take uh, ownership of the process yourself is going to help out. we got a question from YouTube, uh, Tommy Myers, if you want to pull that one up here. All right, we're going to give you guys a scenario. So I'll let you choose who, uh, who answers this one. Let's say that a coach has nine scholarships to offer for swimming, let's say. Is that nine times the cost of going to college? And does a college that costs more have more money to give out. So let's let's start with the first one here. Um, is that nine times the cost of going to college? So a college coach, I'm, I'm going to try to help. Let's keep the three box up. If we, this is going to be a team effort. Team effort on this question. <laughs> I'm I'm college, at the question. I have nine scholarships to offer. Again, if, if it depends on the percentage of the scholarship. If it's a full ride, the full ride is going to cover pretty much everything. But if it's 50%, that may be just be 50% of tuition. That could include books. It could include room and board. Again, that's going to depend um, kind of situationally. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter on the school. If the school is offering the scholarship, the school it's the scholarship's going to be based on what the tuition for the school is, not a general number, if that makes sense. Am I saying that correctly? JJ's asking me a question about a train leaving from Cincinnati at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> Pittsburgh at 30 miles the horse's away. name is Sunday. <laughs> and I'm thinking about how we should call this Neapolitan camera versus three box. That's where my head's at. Like that's that's how basic I am. I, I want to be vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we're totally on a different pages, JJ. But yes, David, you're right. It's it's gonna be it, it depends on the tuition. So yeah, the percentage of the scholarship will amount for more money at a more expensive school. That I mean from a basic standpoint, yeah. Yeah, so if my tuition is $60,000 for my school for a year and I offer you a full ride, it's for that full 60000 If my tuition is 10000 I offer you a full ride, it's for that 10000 So, again, it's based on the tuition at that school, whatever percentage or the full amount would, would break that down. Um, I think we, we, we probably just made it that way more difficult than it needed to be, but hopefully that answered your question. Uh, danae has got a great question here about a parent's role in the recruiting process. I'm going to let both of you guys tackle this. I think this is a, a really good question. Danae wants to know, is it okay for a parent to call and ask the coach questions? Kyle, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's – Christy might give a different answer from me because uh, she was a college coach. I think it's probably okay. I would not recommend it, though. Um, I would say it's probably not your best option. Uh, when I was going through the process myself, I was a very uncomfortable, awkward, um, nervous, shy young kid. And now I'm just a big, awkward, uh, uncomfortable, <laughs> shy kid. Um, but she made me do it. She made me said, this is your responsibility. This is what you're doing. This is what you want to do. You have to have these conversations with the coach. I'll help you with it. I'll, I'll help you do mock conversations and guide you through it. I'll be right there to help you through it and answer any questions that I can step in to do. But at the end of the day, it's going to be much more ideal for the student athlete to have the conversation with that college coach. And, and the coach will know that the parents probably helping out with that as well. But at the end of the day, as a college coach, I'm not recruiting you as a parent. I want to know that I'm going to be dealing with this kid for the next four years. And it's someone that I want to deal with. Uh, so it's you know a little bit time to grow up for him in a sense. Yeah. And I think probably as you get later in the process, Christy, it's probably maybe more, okay for that parent to get involved when it comes to some of the finer questions about money. Um, but again, Kyle's right. For the most part, the student athlete needs to be driving this. But from a coach perspective, how did you handle that? If a parent needed to get on the phone with you, again, they they may just understand the world uh, more than a 16 or 17 year old kid will in terms of how that works. But from a coach's standpoint, how would you look at that if a parent reached out to you um, with questions about a scholarship? Yeah. Um, tricky situation. I think Kyle really hammered at home. Um, we want to hear from student athletes now, you know, David, like you said, parents hopefully have a better understanding than, you know, their 16 year old kid. So with that being said, nine times out of 10, um, if we're offering a scholarship either in person, hopefully your parents are there and, you know, you're on the recruiting trip with, you know, your child, some we could offer that. So then you can ask those questions like in that setting, totally okay and acceptable. Um, getting on the phone, uh, and just kind of calling a coach out of the blue, I wouldn't recommend it. Coaches do not want to hear from you guys as much as 
I think I've said this on a Facebook live once before. We love you guys. You're a very important part of the process. But like Kyle said, we're not recruiting you. We we are recruiting you because, you know, if you're if you're coming in hot, then we're going to be like, oh, man, like we really don't want to have this parent here for four years. We don't really care if the kid's that good. We don't want to deal with the parents. Um, so just be very mindful of that like, yes, we aren't recruiting you, but we are at the same time. Um, we want to hear from your child as much as possible. So if there's going to be a phone call set up, just make sure that your child is present for it. Um, and maybe the conversation could be led by your child with you in the background. And we know that you're there. Um, Cause you know, again, just reiterating what Kyle said, we need student athletes to drive the process. If kids are not interested um, and not self-aware of what's going on, it kind of is like, uh, well, you know, they might fall a little bit far behind. Uh, it's, it's not about the parents. It's about the student athlete. Cool. We'll take two more questions here. Let's go with uh, Sandy first. Uh, this is more of a comment, but we can hopefully provide a little bit of, of guidance in here and help. Sandy's grandson is looking to get recruited, uh, but they're from a small town. Kyle, we talked about the importance of being proactive. In this case, certainly kind of uh, re-preaching -re that in terms of having to be proactive. A lot of kids we talk to are from small towns. Coaches aren't going to find them. You've got to be doing something on your end to, to, to get out there. Yeah, Sandy, coming from a small town, you can pretty much guarantee that a college coach isn't going to find your student athlete. Uh, again, not to say that it hasn't happened before and it won't happen again because it probably will, but um, I would just not assume that a coach is going to happen to come across your team happen to come across your, your grandson and see him in his finest moment. There's too many stars that have to align. We can say that about most sports, whether it's going out to a tournament, a showcase, a camp, whatever it may be. There's hundreds, if not some cases, thousands of student athletes there. Coaches only have a specific amount of time, and they're not, they're not just going ran, around randomly to high school games or tournaments and just hoping that they're going to happen to see someone. You don't want to leave the chance that coach is going to show up to that game. Your grandson is going to be playing. He does really well when that coach happens to be watching and ends up wanting to recruit your, your grandson. So for you guys, get video, be proactive. The Internet has made recruiting so much easier for everybody across the, the country and world because you guys can you, you can develop exposure without having to have someone come watch you in person. So be the ones who are driving this. Be proactive. Cool. Last question we're going to take. Let's stick with the Neapolitan box. We're going to go from Damien. This is another very situational one. Um, but Damien's question is, if offered a scholarship in a dollar amount, is it okay to counter with a percentage amount? So if that tuition changes, the amount is in my favor. Um, if my understanding is correct, I believe the offers would be percentage-based to begin with. Christy, is that correct? Yes. Yes, they so would. If I'm offered 40% of a scholarship, and then next year the tuition increases by 5,000 and I'm still on 40% of a scholarship, that 40% will still be based on the tuition for that year, not what I initially had as a freshman. Yes. And if coaches, if there's a coach and whoever asked this question, if you're in this situation, I would just straight up ask the coach why they are presenting a dollar amount and not percentage. Listen, coaches are going to try to nickel and dime everything because they want to get as many types of scholarships as possible throughout their team. Um, never, I personally never offered via a dollar amount. It's always based on a percentage. So just ask that coach. But at the end of the day, David, yes, you are right. It's normally by a percentage. So then if the cost does go up, you're still covered. Yeah. And again, college coaches have, let's say 10 scholarships to offer their program, the scholarship isn't worth a certain amount. And again, that, that scholarship can change. So they're offering percentages of those scholarships versus, all right, well, each scholarship for me is worth $50,000. So I'm going to offer you $20,000. It's no, I have a scholarship. I'm going to offer you a half of a scholarship. And that's going to cover half of the tuition or whatever uh, the case is. Some, some really in-depth, I wish I would have more than 30 seconds before I'm reading the question to, 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 to analyze it, but I think we're doing a good job, guys. I'm just picturing a college coach handing someone a bag full of money with dollar signs on it that says tuition on it. I, I don't think that's how it works typically. Yeah, I think, that's uh, I think you should go be a head coach. I think that's an yeah. NCAA violation. Is <laughs> Here's a bag of, I guess these days, NIL though, right? So. Tuition. Tuition. <laughs> All right, cool. Appreciate the questions. We've uh, we've gone well past half hour, but that's good. There's good questions. Uh, but as we do every week, we want to uh, acknowledge and recognize some of our uh, recent commitments. So, uh, Mr. Winners, we'll have you kick us off. 
Awesome. Yeah, our first uh, commitment today is Brendan Bernhardt. Brendan started uh, working with us here about two and a half years ago in 2019. Uh, he's been working with us ever since and, and been very active in the process. He's going to be heading to Albright College. He's a catcher from Pennsylvania. Um, if you guys don't know Pennsylvania, there's like 150 different universities there. So there's a lot to choose from, a lot of different opportunities. But um, obviously, he was very successful in the recruiting process, got a really solid amount of views from college coaches, was able to use his profile and and find the school to the right fit for him. So congratulations to uh, to you, Brendan, um, and congrats on all the success in your process. I think we're sticking to you for softball. Coming, coming right back to me for softball with Kristen, Kristen Tesh, set it to Grove City College. Another student athlete that started working with us, uh, you know, not, not it was a, a little ways back, um, back in 2018 for this one, and she's uh, just now starting up her um, senior year, but – uh, was viewed by Grove City College where she's headed uh, multiple times. The, the school followed her. Um, again, was very proactive, had a lot of uh, interactions from college coaches, 56 different views, 17 different follows from coaches, sent out a lot of emails, and obviously is headed to a school that's going to be a great fit for her. So congrats to you as well, Kristen. Well, we're going to hit a younger student athlete here. Uh, we have Peyton Bezik, uh, 2023 grad. So she's currently a junior in high school lacrosse player. Uh, out of Florida, her goal was to play D1, and uh, she's going to be uh, attaining that goal here, uh, committing to Virginia Tech, uh, obviously an ACC program. Um, Peyton had a, a lot of interest from D1 programs and, and, again, set out the goal of playing at the D1 level, and uh, she'll be able to, to do that. So, again, in Peyton's situation, she's committed to that school. Uh, they probably had some conversations about scholarships, I'd imagine, but, again, she won't be able to uh, physically sign her national letter of intent for that scholarship until – uh, her senior year, so a little uh, about a year from now. So, um, again, appreciate Kyle Winters, Christina Sippany, Cicero. We're, we're different with the Neapolitan here. We're adding some some flavor to it, but uh, some great information. Again, the scholarship process, obviously something that a lot of parents uh, are interested in and, and wanting to pursue. So if you guys have any questions, again, about the process, anything specific to your student athlete and what you're going to, reach out to us. This is what we do. Um, help provide that guidance, provide that education, or uh, for families looking to kick start this process, uh, let us know. We'll get a profile going for your student athlete and make sure that um, you guys are all on the right path here. This is, this is what we do, CNC and Kyle, right? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, Kyle and uh, Philip Wells will be back here next Tuesday to add some more knowledge. Christy, again, we appreciate you, you hopping on. I know you had a busy uh, day here, but uh, again, <laughs> knowledge is, is priceless from you, CNC. So thank you. Uh, but hope everyone has a great week, and uh, we'll see you guys back here uh, next Tuesday.